Now we have our deformers, but as we recognized in the past, if I go moving this, then suddenly these deformers are going to work much differently. All right, now it's really messing up our spoon. So we need those to travel with it. In fact, this is actually just going to be difficult to animate entirely, right? If I needed to squash my object and I have to go in here and find my squash handle and then go over here and find squash one and then find factor and then squash it, right? And that's like five or six steps just to get my object to squash. So if I have to make a whole bunch of changes, it's going to get really time consuming. So the next steps we're going to do are going to allow us to create a custom rig that's just going to let us animate one object that controls everything. So to do that, I'm going to create a NURB circle. Again, just like when we created our car, a NURB circle is not going to show up in renders. So if I click this circle, you'll see that it creates it at the origin of our world. And this is one of the reasons that it's easier to do these rigging processes back at the origin. But since I've already moved my object, I can still align this NURBS curve to other elements. So let's take our squash handle, for example. Its pivot point is already at the bottom of the spoon. So we can use modify and match transformations in order to match the location of this circle to the location of our squash handle. I'm going to make it smaller so we can see this a little more clearly. But if I select my circle and then I select my squash handle, I usually do this by holding control and selecting it in the outliner. Then I can go to modify, match transformations, and I can match just my translations. Now you'll see my NURB circle is in the same location as my squash handle. Now that means that my NURB circle has some information on it though that will make it difficult if I ever need to zero this character back out. So what I'm going to do is do modify freeze transformations and I'm also going to go ahead and delete by type history. And I'm going to name this NURB circle Spoon CTRL for control. Now, the reason I created this is because now I can manipulate one object and it will control the entire spoon and both of the deformers. So the easiest way to make that happen is just to parent these objects underneath our NURB circle. So I'll select the two deformers and the spoon and then I will middle click on those objects and drag them on top of the spoon control. Now you'll see that all of those objects are parented underneath the spoon control, meaning if I wanted to animate just this control, all of those objects go with me. Recognize I just have the spoon control selected right now, not the objects that are underneath it. They all highlight as if they're selected as well, but the only thing that is being selected and the only thing that would be keyframed would be the control itself. So you'll notice that in our channel box, we only have translates, rotates, and scale values. I'm going to add some new values at the bottom for squash and stretch and our bend options. To do this, we go to modify and add attribute. Now since I have the spoon selected, it's going, the, it's going to add the attribute to the spoon. And I'll call this first one Squash. I'm naming it a shorter name just so it doesn't take up as much room in the channel box. Now there's a couple of different data types for this. You'll notice that our translates are all numbers that can have decimal places to them. That's called a float value. An integer is just a whole number, whereas visibility has the option to be either on or off. Um, we could do that a couple of different ways with either a Boolean or an enum option. 
right now I'm going to go ahead and stick to float. And since I've named it squash, I can hit add and watch what happens in our channel box. Now we have a new attribute called squash. Unfortunately, that value doesn't do anything. I can select that and change it all day long. It's not controlling anything. It's just a number, just a placeholder. So now I need to connect squash to our squash handle. Specifically, I need to connect it to our factor. So to do that, I'll select my control and I'll go to Windows, General Editors, and then if I scroll down, we'll choose Connection Editor. Now what our Connection Editor does is it connects one value or one node to another node. This is a direct connection. So for example, I could connect my translate x value to another object's translate y value. And what that would mean is if I moved my object in translate x, the other object would move the same amount in translate y. So this is what the connection editor is for. And if I scroll to the bottom, you'll see that my squash attribute is there. If yours didn't load, it just meant that you didn't have your object selected when you went to your connection editor. So just select the spoon control and hit reload left. Now, whatever is on the left will control whatever we have selected on the right. So that means we need to load something into the right section of this to have something to control. The thing we want to control is our squash handle. But if I load the squash handle, you'll see that the thing we're looking for, factor, isn't here. Um, trust me on this, I know there's a lot of values on there, but you can look for a long time and you're not going to find that. That's because when I select the object and hit load, I'm loading the overall object. So I'm loading the thing that controls the translates, the rotates, and the scales. I really need to be loading this squash one input. So if I just go down here and select squash one and then hit reload right, you'll see it brings in the squash one instead of squash one handle. And there's factor. So to connect these two together, all I have to do is choose the word on the left and then choose the word on the right. So I'm gonna connect squash to factor. When I do, you'll notice that factor turns yellow. That means something else is controlling it. In the same way that a keyframe causes a channel to turn red, whenever we're controlling something with a direct connection, it causes the channel to turn yellow. That means I can't manually control factor here anymore. Something else is controlling it. The thing that's controlling it is our squash value on our control. So if I change that squash value now, you'll see that my object squashes and stretches. That's really nice because that means I don't even need to be able to see my squash handle anymore. I can do all of my animation just on this control. So I'll select the squash handle and hit control H to hide it. Now I wanna add a couple of more attributes to this control as well. I wanna add something that controls my bend deformer, specifically the curvature of the bend deformer. But as we saw earlier, sometimes we maybe want to rotate that. So I also want to be able to control my rotate Y. And it wouldn't be a bad idea to be able to control the height of that bend control. So I'm going to create three new attributes on my controller. I'll go to Modify, Add Attribute, and the first one I'll call Bend, and I'll hit Add. The second one I'll call Bend Angle, and I'll hit Add. And then the third I'll call Bend Height, and I'll hit Add. And so now I have these three new attributes. So we're going to use the connection editor again. I'll go to Windows, 
general editor, connection editor. And you'll see that since I didn't have my control selected the last time, it didn't load it into the left. So I can select my control and hit reload left. And you'll see that those three new attributes are visible down at the bottom. Now the things I want to control on the bend handle are the bend angle and the bend height. So let's go ahead and do that first because it makes sense. If I just have bend handle selected and I hit reload right, you'll see that I do have options for translates and rotates. I'll need to expand these out to connect them to the correct ones. So for bend angle, that was our rotate Y. So I'll choose bend angle and rotate Y. And so now you'll see the rotate Y is being driven by our bend angle attribute. Our bend height attribute was our translate Y. Now you'll see that when I do that, it lowers it all the way down to the ground. And so that's a little bit problematic, but it's not too big of a deal. We can always adjust that on our controller. However, the thing I need to connect bend to is not on the handle, it's on the input. So again, if I select bend one and the input and hit reload right, now I can choose our curvature. So I'm gonna choose bend and curvature and everything should be hooked up correctly now. I can go ahead and hide my bend one handle, control H to hide that. And in fact, I can go ahead and lock my spoon mesh because I don't need to move that. Everything that I need to be able to control my rig is now on this control. So I'll click this two more times and you'll see that the only thing I select is that curve and I am able to move my object I'm able to rotate my object. I am able to add squash to my object. And I'm able to bend my object. Now if I bend it, it's bending it all the way from the ground. So I have to raise that height up a little bit. And you'll see that it's a little touchy. So I'll hold control while I'm doing that. There we go. And adjust my bend angle. Now, one last thing I wanted to talk about. These two deformers are deforming the same vertices. So the order in which I created them actually makes a difference on how this object will deform. I'm both squashing it and bending it right now. And the order I place them on the object determines which one of those deformations happen first. So to understand this, imagine deforming a spoon in the real world. Imagine you have a, an aluminum spoon that's easy to bend. If you bent that spoon in half and then squashed it vertically, you would end up with a very specific shape. Versus if you squashed that spoon first and then tried to bend it, you would end up with a different shape as well. Uh, think of an aluminum can or anything that you could deform in that way. So Maya can change the way this is deforming based off of the order in which you created those inputs. So let me show you what I'm talking about. If I right click on this object and I go to inputs and all inputs, you'll see that I first need to select the actual spoon you'll see that the order in which these are happening are the orders in which we place the deformers on the object. And it reads from the bottom up. So I applied the squash deformer first, so squashing is happening first. And then I applied the bend deformer, so it bends after it squashes it. If I middle click on bend one and drag it below squash, you'll see I get a different result. Um, if I go in here and adjust my squash and stretch, you'll see that my squash and stretch is giving us this and our bend is giving us this. 
Now this isn't really better. I just wanted to show you that sometimes the issues you are going to get are related to this input order. So I'll go ahead and drag my squash one back below bend. The reason for that is because you could continue adding additional deformers to this if you would like. If you would like to add a twist to this or a wave deformer, you can. And then we can continue to create additional controls on here that allow us to animate this object. 